I always worry when I get into any kind of body of water in a game that there's going to be that they're going to think because of course they're going to want to that there's going to be a shark that comes right at me and tries to eat my face off. In uh, the last segment, we were talking a little bit about a certain game that takes place in microgravity, and yes, I wanted to talk a little more in depth about the logistics of setting a game in microgravity and the problem therein because i've seen this in a lot of games that are usually spacey um recently i played prey and there are outer space sections in that dead space 3 i played this year again and there are outer space sections in that um even starfield has has certain areas where you do that and they never also feel mentioned, good. Yes. You've mm-hmm. also mentioned Subnautica in the last one, which technically not microgravity is fairly close to the approximation of being weightless, I assume. Yeah, but it doesn't it it doesn't well we'll get into the problem with the microgravity, but it does mitigate that a little bit by being in water rather than being in space, so to speak. Okay. The problem with microgravity seems to be the disorienting nature of trying to get around when you are continuously floating in a direction and trying yes. to... Uh, it's sort of like, actually, um, have you ever played uh, like some kind of a racing game that's like a water-based racing game? Or it's on ice. Maybe you hit... Nope. No, no, no. Um, not, not since I ever went to an arcade where they've got that one hydroplane racing game. Where oh, you race yeah, the boats. yeah, 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 yeah. The idea of microgravity seems to be that uh, we're now in three dimensions, which is a problem with water levels too. But with microgravity, we just keep moving in certain directions with seemingly no end. And I'm trying to track down resources in some of these games. I'm, I'm trying to lock on to targets. I'm trying to do all of these things, but now I'm constantly like floating around. The precision of the on-ground sections is gone. My, yeah. <laughs> the precision of my controls is just gone. And I am now living in like an amorphous blob out in space. <laughs> <laughs> that just yeah. keeps kind of like throwing me around in general directions and I find that it's a problem for the gameplay experience because a lot of these don't give you a way to stop or pause in the location that you're in yeah I will say as our last segment we talked about breathage um, I will say one thing they did do well for that is that the, you have a key dedicated to stabilizing yourself I think if you're setting a game and anything like that, you should have some Same kind of way to stabilize yourself. Yeah. Hard Space Shipbreaker also had a way to stabilize yourself. You could actually was, hold on. You could hold on right, to the ship. Right. Either it was grab onto something, or I think there was a button dedicated to that as well. I was playing on a controller. Could, I think it was the two sticks. If you press the two sticks at the same time, it stopped you. Yes, altogether. it would stop you from drifting. But you could stabilize yourself, and you could also rotate to orientate yourself how you want Yes. So... Yeah. Those do it well. It's almost a requirement that you have to be able to rotate yourself around and that you have to be able to have a way to stop at some point because uh, I've seen games that don't. In the few sections where Starfield gets you into zero G, like when you get to the artifact sites, I really just felt like I was floating into nothingness most of the time. And, and yeah. it's tricky because they want you to hit certain glowing points to unlock, uh, you know, the ancient artifacts. And so you're going towards them, and as soon as you hit it, it moves to a new location, but you're still floating backwards, so you're trying to compensate in order to get back to the other place. It's not a great system, and I'm thankful that it rarely is a mechanic that they utilize in that game, outside of a few really specific sections. Um, But it just makes the whole game world feel much floatier uh, than before. Literally. Literally, yeah. Um, I'm not a fan of water levels as a general rule, even though I just had said Subnautica was far better than, than Breathage. Um, for the same basic reason, uh, you know, I'm going into water and everything just feels very floaty, and I am now in three dimensions, so orientating yourself if you're trying to get to an objective becomes really difficult. 
uh, up and down. That's another thing I see some games really struggle with, is being able to explain to people, am I up on different levels, am I down on different levels when I'm going through them. Um, Water is definitely one of those things that, uh, similar with microgravity, uh, games tend to have a hard time with, unless they are system-specifically made for that to be the thing. Uh, right. An example from the game, one of my games, it's World of Warcraft, of course, you can swim underwater. Mm -hmm. And it's whatever, aiming is a little bit hard, telling distance is a little bit harder underwater. You know, that yeah. makes sense, but it's annoying. Whereas during Cataclysm, they had a whole zone that was just underwater, and they redid the entire zone, or they did the entire zone, so that it made sense. Mm -hmm. And it felt like you were underwater, and it felt good being underwater. It didn't have the weird issue. If you were swimming, you were swimming, and if you were sitting on the floor of the ocean, you had, like, an ability that let you, like, bound across the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Like, increase your speed and let you breathe underwater and whatever. But the zone felt good because the entire thing was built around being underwater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't just like, oh, you're swimming underwater in any other zone. It is just, you're underwater. This is the entire mechanic here, and we built it around that. Right. Right. Yeah, I, um, I don't, like, microgravity definitely, uh, trips me up a lot more, I think, than even water, because at least in the water levels, usually there's a, a floor that you, right. you go to. There's an ocean floor. Uh, but also because there is some resistance, so they don't usually program it to be as floaty. Um, but the, but there is then one other problem when it comes to water, which is that resistance usually leads you to needing to, uh, like, accelerating really slowly. And so you have to decelerate, it, you know, the, you might decelerate pretty quickly, but you have to accelerate really fast, which in precise control games becomes a real a real issue or when you had to do the uh the ship to ship combat in all of those games where i have to figure out how to turn the ship around while it's floating into one direction yeah it's the floatiness that's the problem more than anything yeah. and i think that microgravity ends up being uh really really poor for that because you don't always slow down now breathage will also do a thing where if you just leave your controls alone for enough time it will eventually slow you down to zero, but it's a process. <laughs> it's it's a length of time. Which, if you're in microgravity, you would you wouldn't do that, right? Or zero gravity, even you wouldn't do that. You would have to actively decelerate, right? Right. And uh, yeah, <laughs> there's there's no air resistance in space to slow you down, which is why it's fairly easy to keep gaining speed with things you go hey like here's the thing with breathage too you said we mentioned how it was slow mm -hmm. uh you're like 10 meters a second but once you let off that you're you go slower it's like no in space if you were to do uh go six meters and then propel yourself to go 10 meters you would stay at 10 meters and then more propulsion you add would just add speed right Right. Even through all of the floatiness of it, the system still doesn't really abide by the physics of space. <laughs> right. You know, if I keep thrusting, I should continually go faster and faster and faster. It would just not, it would just take longer than if I'm in a ship or something like right. that. But then if you're decelerating, you would also have to apply more deceleration force right. to be able to stop. So it should be a process to speed up and then a process to slow down oh yeah which which would be fine i kind of like the idea of saying well you got your accelerator on you and you just thrust and you keep going as fast as you could possibly imagine going but if you're not decelerating when you get to the other side and you hit anything like you yeah. hit you hit the smallest particles we put into the into the atmosphere the the little ship parts it's going to crack your helmet and damage yeah. you badly, you know? Yeah, and that's that's one of those things. Like, you know, as the people that are way smarter than us have mentioned, like, if you're going the speed of light, then deceleration becomes a big problem. Yeah, you can't even necessarily tell uh, what you're decelerating to <laughs> in the first place. 
because you can't see it if you're going the speed of light. Um, yeah. Even Star Wars has has this thing. When Han was like, "What do you think you're gonna just hit hyperdrive without plotting a course first? You'll go head first into a planet." Right. Exactly. Like you yes, know, that's in uh, you know the original Star Wars. And Han's looking at Luke like, "No, no, you gotta plot a course, otherwise you're gonna warp yourself into an asteroid." Yeah. You know. Don't get cocky, kid. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, you you have to be uh, conscientious about that because you're creating this big open space. Um, I I don't know the better way to solve that problem um, outside of just trying to mitigate using microgravity as a as, as a setting for exploration, um, but putting some kind of, of resistance mechanics in there just so that it feels tighter. Uh, I'm, like, out there in the middle of, well, Breathage, like, trying to figure out where all of these little, little tiny, you know, resources are. These little globes floating in the, in the atmosphere. And I, I'm, I'm going towards them and, like, quickly bypassing them and ro rotating back to try and orient myself to them. There's very few gains to what you're doing <laughs> in that in that uh, space. So uh, either, either trying to figure out how to track stuff better so that the motion controls feel more stable in my hands, or putting things closer to me. You know, I, I think one of the problems I've seen with so many space games has I played more than I thought I was going to just in the last few months. Um, is it doesn't need to be as spread out as this. You could you could this have is, the distance to everything. <laughs> this is uh, I've mentioned before. We've talked about it. Space is setting words, guys. I get it. You want space to feel massive, but maybe for the players and for the scope of your game, maybe don't have it quite as massive. Right. We can limit the scope of this area and get the same amount of stuff out of it because uh, it's usually just a lot of mindless traversal through the black inky void that you've yeah. provided to us. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's definitely not my favorite part of games. Um, and I usually am yearning for a, a, a place with gravity that I can set down on. Uh, the only times where I found it interesting in, like, Starfield, for instance, was when they said, hey, here's planets that have, like, really just low gravity. And you could use your thrusters to, like, bound really high up in the air and over terrain yeah. and then come... That I found fun, because, you know, it, yeah. it's like, low gravity is kind of cool. But microgravity becomes, like, a real problem from the logistics of traversal. Um, so, I guess that's a, a small rant about the issue with microgravity. And to a lesser extent, um, aquatic landscapes. Uh, but, I mean, I think the other problem I have with aquatic landscapes is anytime they put in a water thing, Sharks have to be in it, and sharks yeah, do know like how sharks. to deal with. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I have a thing about sharks in games. I always worry when I get into any kind of body of water in a game that there's going to be that they're going to think because of course they're going to want to that there's going to be a shark that comes right at me and tries to eat my face off. Of course. It's hey, like, at least you enjoyed like Maneater. Yeah, but see, I liked that because I was I was the shark. Exactly. I was the shark eating people. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> game of the year man eater <laughs> and and that actually gets around the water problem because sharks are aerodynamic and built for the water so you use the water right. as a proper motility device yes. and then the land doesn't feel right so you know. right the other thing with space too here here's just a side note for space it's not it's on the aerodynamic part is um a, a lot of Games that have like space and spaceships, they always look like they're aerodynamic craft for some reason. Yeah, I then I still don't understand that because it's not it, there's no point to it. Yeah, um, there is that one thing from the Hitchhiker's Guide where the Vogon constructor ships look like giant yellow bricks hanging in space because they don't need to be aerodynamic in space unless they right. are atmospheric craft. And then there's the thing with Star Wars where a lot of their spaceships, the smaller fighters and stuff, are aerodynamic, like for the Rebels, the A-Wing for instance, aerodynamic, because it's a very good 
you know, atmospheric craft. Whereas TIE fighters and TIE bombers, for instance, really not that great in atmosphere. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, I am reminded of uh, something I thought was very interesting from Star Trek, which is that a lot of those ships are built to be more aerodynamic, but the Borg, you know, the assimilation, the assimilation uh, group that's supposed to be technologically advanced because they keep assimilating all the knowledge, they were like, cubes. They're just big cubes. Yeah. <laughs> I can keep up with you in my freaking cube. Right. Space doesn't care about your aerodynamics, so why why are our ships aerodynamic? This is the best way that we can utilize space, is in a cube. I can keep m most stuff in the smallest amount of space in a cube. <laughs> I mean, they're not wrong, so... Yeah, and then the, the thing that they only did to make it more aerodynamic later is, I think, was it like one of their capital ships? Were, was a sphere. <laughs> I thought you were going to say a spoiler. Oh, yeah, no. No, it would be cool if you put a spoiler on a board cube, though. That'd be pretty, that'd be pretty sweet. Extra, uh, extra large rims. Pimp out my cube. Pimp my cube. Anyway, uh, but no, they put, they made a sphere. It's like, oh, alright. <laughs> I guess, sure, why not, but. Right. Yeah. Okay, sure, why not? Yeah, if you're creating a ship that isn't going to be in gravity at all, there's no point in making it aerodynamic. Yeah, pretty much. Anyway, that's been our TED Talk on aerodynamics and ship design for space. So, yes. to, to all the space billionaires out there listening, you're welcome. We've, we've helped you tremendously.